the history is specific, but it's also global, right? Mm -hmm. We have, we see it right in front of our eyes right now. Um, you know, a history of, of colonialism, of, of racism, um, and that's something that we should all remember too. Yeah. You know, as black people especially, we are certainly not the only ones mm -hmm. uh, that have been oppressed, and everybody should remember that. Well, good evening. My name is Yemisi Olontola Coates, and I am GBH's first ever Chief Inclusion and Equity Officer. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Where we strive to elevate the I in inclusion and the E in equity. The next two and a half hours will exemplify how n so meaningful progress can occur if inclusion and equity are left out of the conversation. So before that conversation happens, I will read to you our land acknowledgement, which, has, which was unveiled publicly last year. GBH honors the Massachusetts, Wapanoag, and Nipmuc peoples who ancestral lands provide the foundation for GBH's Massachusetts studios, boroughs, and transmitter. We honor the cultures, contributions, and connections of native indigenous people of our work, our local community, our commonwealth, and our nation. Further, we recognize the importance of moving beyond acknowledgement and towards action. We commit to learning from, including elevating nat native indigenous voices, people's perspectives, voices, and languages locally and nationally through our public media mission. As an educational media organization with national and local audiences, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to support native and indigenous people's voices and stories to bring visibility to their issues and concerns, and to challenge colonialist narratives that have shaped the way history was, has been taught. GBH calls all and employees affiliated with the institution and its work to help transform this shared intention into action. Thank you. And now, please welcome our president and CEO, Susan Goldberg. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to GBH. I'm Susan Goldberg, president and CEO. Tonight, we're going to talk about one of our nation's most urgent and unanswered questions. We'll be examining the historic record and the discussion now underway in Boston and around the nation about reparations. Tonight's gathering is the first of many that we plan this year as part of a new GBH-wide initiative. It's called Reckoning and Repair, and the aim across platforms and programs is to help listeners, viewers, and readers understand the nuance, debate, ambiguity, and possible action resulting from the legacy of slavery in the United States. For many Americans, this discussion is deeply personal. Experts say that between 70 and 80 percent of black people whose families were in America before 1900 are descendants of the enslaved. We'll begin tonight with some clips from GBH's new podcast, What is Owed? And we'll hear from its host, GBH News reporter Soraya Wintersmith. Our morning edition host, Paris Alston, will lead us in a discussion with the team involved in the podcast production. This podcast will establish Boston as both a historic and contemporary epicenter for the reparations movement, offering audiences a way to understand the current conversations and diverse perspectives about the issue. Then we'll watch world's powerful film, The Cost of Inheritance. This one-hour documentary introduces us to descendants of enslaved people 
and descendants of those who enslaved them, profiling their complex, intertwined relationship and detailing their quest to bridge divides. Two of the people featured in the film, Sarah Eisner and Randy Quarterman, are here tonight, along with the film's director, Yoruba Richin. So we'll talk with them as well. Later this year, our history series, American Experience, our investigative documentary series, Frontline, and Basic Black and Stories from the Stage also will fe feature episodes on reparative justice. I'd like to especially thank our board chair, Ann Fudge, who's here tonight, and for her support of this important initiative. We're also deeply grateful to the Barr Foundation for their three-year, $750,000 grant to support this effort. This generous support will also help us launch a unit in our newsroom that will focus on issues of equity and inequity, expand our outreach to historically excluded communities, deepen our relationships with media leaders, and create a civic dialogue around these defining issues. GBH is committed to storytelling that examines systemic inequities in our society, driving thoughtful conversations like the one that you'll hear tonight and offering possible solutions toward a better world. So thank you so much for joining us. Now, let me please welcome Chris Hastings, the Editor-in-Chief of World, and Lee Hill, Executive Editor of GBH News. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Hastings, Editor-in-Chief and Executive Producer of GBH's World. And I want to say, the first to say to you, Happy Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. <laughs> And I'm Lee Hill, executive editor for GBH News. Happy Black History Month, indeed. Chris, I'm so proud of this moment and the work of our teams. Uh, folks, the content that you will hear about tonight, the film, the podcast, has been a long time in the making. Lots of brainstorming, research, and courageous conversations with ourselves, with our communities to get to this point. And I'm so proud to work at an institution that values this work. So thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, members of our board who are here. And Pam Johnston and Liz Chang, our general managers in their absence. I want to say, as we commemorate Black History Month, Chris, there aren't many media companies where you see two black men in executive content roles the way we're standing here tonight. Proud of us. <laughs> I'm proud of us, and I'm really proud of you and the local team. Um, this has been a journey. Yes. I mean, I've been here for 21 years, and I am excited by the work you are doing and planning. And so, thank you for the work you're doing and the team that you brought here today. Um, this is a really exciting night for me personally. Um, before I bring your attention to the film and to the podcast. You know, I think community conversations are meant to be a little bit interactive. Uh, we've been screening the film The Cost of Inheritance around the country for the past month. Um, and I want to put up a slide real quick. Um, and we've been asking a, a really basic question. What do reparations mean to you? Now, if you're so indulged to respond to this question the night after you finish the film, after you hear the conversation, please do so. Um, we are on WhatsApp and on Instagram. Please send us a message. Um, there's no wrong answer here, <laughs> but I think what we want to do is just be open and hear from you. It's meant to be a two-way situation with this. Yes, and thank you, Chris, for being such a good partner in all of this. Um, before we get to the film, we are going to give you all a sneak preview of the podcast, followed by a conversation with its host, Soraya Wintersmith, senior producer, Jerome Campbell, and moderated by GBH News Morning Edition host, Paris Austin. I'm so proud of them, y'all, I can't even tell you. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, all people, everyone, I present to you what is owed.
how would you describe Boston to somebody who doesn't know about it here, has never been here? Small, one-horse town, but major city. Revolutionary spirit that runs through the city. The history of the city is integral to the country. But there's another part of its history that's less prideful, and maybe even more important. Boston, the birthplace of America's democracy, was the first place in the country to legalize slavery. And that decision paved its cobblestone streets with burgeoning opportunity and deep roots of systematic racism. We don't like to talk so much about the role that Boston played in helping to finance this boom in trade. Boston has a deep racial history and there's a lot of trauma that so many of us still carry. Now Boston is recognizing there's an unpaid debt for more than 400 years of exploitation. The big question, what's the modern version of 40 acres and a mule? We always know that we're owed reparations. Only question is whether or not America is going to be so racist as not to pay us. This is what I deserve and you should pay me. I want what is owed to me. From GBH News, I'm Soraya Wintersmith. This is What is Owed, a podcast exploring what it looks like for one of America's oldest cities to figure out its reparations debt and how that effort fits into the greater movement for reparations in the country. The town of Evanston made history in 2021 when it became the first municipality. California's first of its kind task force on reparations for black Americans has submitted. The city council of Asheville, North Carolina, unanimously voted to provide reparations to black residents of the city. This is a story about Boston, a history that passes through it and the moment that extends far beyond it. We're centering the stories of the black leaders, trailblazers, and troublemakers who've been pondering these questions for over 150 years, like those who fought for reparations and were denied. We issue a call for all persons of color to band together. He knew that that was a longer term struggle. The people in the thick of the struggle. We do stand the risk of producing something that people will call reparations and shut the door on further action and the lessons learned along the way. That for the first time caused this community to pause and say, oh, we were not this liberal community that we thought we were. Boston is once again trying to change the course of its history. This is the story of that new American revolution. What is Owed comes out in February. You can listen anywhere you enjoy your favorite podcasts. Applause. It's Black History Month. We're going to be clapping a whole lot this evening. <laughs> well, first of all, Soraya Jerome, I just want to say congratulations. That is amazing. The energy is there. I am very proud of both of you as friends, as colleagues. Um, and, and I want to hear from you two. I mean, how do you feel seeing your work put out to this audience in this way and knowing that, that this moment is happening? This is amazing. We're supposed to turn on our mic. <laughs> no. Hello? There we go. Yes? Yes, yes no? Yes. yes? This is super amazing. I'm trying to keep in mind that this is a friendly audience and none of the contention about the issue is here. Uh, but it feels really, really good to see the work come to fruition and know that other people are excited to enjoy it. We're excited to share it with people. Yeah. yeah um I think I found myself getting a little emotional. I think listening to it, it's been oh, a very cathartic process of sort of doing the work <coughs> and I think also doing the work and, it, and feeling the resonance of it, not only yourself and now getting to share it with you all and feeling that resonance, it's really moving. What, I mean, we, we've seen this preview, so we do know a bit about what this podcast is about, but, but why is it needed now? Um, I mean, there's so many ways you can answer that question, right? Because now is, now is a complicated time. 
I think the long and short of it is that the city of Boston made a decision that it was going to explore the possibility of reparations. And we know that it is just from the montage that we heard within the podcast, just one of many places across the country that's now open to exploring its own culpability. And so if the city is in this moment, a city with, again, as we heard in the trailer, this reputation of struggling with racism, with people who pass through because of the schools, because of the sports teams, and interact with the people and feel that something is not quite right. It's a momentous thing for the government to say, we have to own up to this, we have to face this. I think just to add to that, I think it's also that I mean, coming off of the pandemic, coming off of 2020, after the, all the marches, um, all the political conversations, it felt like there was a conversation that wasn't just happening here in Boston, it was happening everywhere. And people were trying to figure out, well, if we're thinking around this idea, how do we do it? And it feels like that was sort of the on-road that led us to this podcast. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like people, from, from your journey in producing this and reporting this, that people are really ready to have that conversation? We gonna see when episode one. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Boston obviously is, otherwise we wouldn't have had unanimous legislation that said go ahead and explore it. I think if you don't live in Boston proper and you don't live in the state of Massachusetts where there is a bill percolating and there's been a committee hearing on that bill and we have to see what the legislature is going to do. Even if you live in a place where the government hasn't moved and decided, you're going to have to face the conversation because we've seen the state of California and we've seen the state of New York and Jerome and I just had a side conversation about <laughs> someone here within the state of Massachusetts who's on a task force for the state of New Jersey because they're trying to get their own bill. So it is inevitable. If you're not ready, you better get ready. <laughs> <laughs> and what are some things that, that Boston can learn from those other places? I mean, what will the podcast explore in terms of of the steps that have been taken to do this? I think the podcast is really exploring some of the questions of feasibility, and that's not the sexy way to say it, but that's what it is. Um, I was saying to one of our colleagues last week, uh, and to you this week, if you are our age or better, then you probably remember a time where you tried to have a conversation about it because you thought, maybe this is a valid idea, there's no discussion that something happened in America where people were discriminated against, robbed of their humanity, made to work without pay, something that we think is unimaginable now. But for some reason, if you've tried to have the conversation, even in recent history, it's been a bit of a non-starter or a far-flung idea. Um, and it's not that anymore. Hmm. What changed? This is why I don't like the preview because I have to be the annoying person to say, you gotta listen to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, you can't give you away listen all to the enough. podcast. But, but we, uh, Jerome, you, bo you both mentioned a little bit about that and about this, this reckoning that we are still going through. Um, that, ha that has been happening for, it's like interesting because yeah. it's been happening for some people and then in 2020 it just started happening for other, some other people, yeah. right? But we've been here and we keep revisiting these things over and over. Um, you mentioned how in the US, we haven't had this conversation in this way before, um, but there, ha there we know that there are other places in the world that have. Um, are, are there similarities yeah. that will be explored? You're really trying to get <laughs> some information out of us. I mean, y'all know I'm a journalist. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. No, I think, I think that as far as, I think to answer your question, I think that what we've come across in the reporting is that reparation has, reparations is as old as the country. It's a story that um, actually has roots here in Boston. We look at, we look at, we look, we look at the roots that started here. Yes. 
we look at um, the roots that actually were also here during the like post civil rights era, um, and we talk about you know the people now like Julia Mejia, who's put who proposed the legislation first to the Boston City Council. We also look at um, other element other peer, times in history. We look at. Uh, um, what was going on, uh, how the country of Austria uh, had thought about reparations. We also talk about instances where the US has thought about reparations, mm -hmm. looking at the Japanese internment and the uh, National Indian Commission that, that followed looking at how land could be returned to many um, indigenous mm -hmm. tribes. So there's, there's definitely a framework that, pe that people have been working through for a very long time. So the question is, how do we take that model and do it locally? And how do we decide who are the people that were that a government who may not have been thinking about this idea as maybe as thoughtfully as black people have for generations? What does it mean when a government has to now hold the water, so to speak? Mm. What does it mean when a government has to sort of adopt generations and generations of thought and deep critical thinking around this topic and then deliver it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love in this trailer, Soraya, that obviously you are our guiding voice and you take us, take us through this journey here. Is that what we can expect in the podcast? Is, is, are, are we sort of in the passenger seat with you as you're driving along on this journey? I will say that you are, but as part of this project, I was super careful not to make it about my views or my opinions. We know that because of how we look and the job that we do and the subject matter that we're exploring with this project, it's inevitable that people are gonna look at it and look at me and assume that they know where I stand on each of the themes that come up as we're exploring. Um, but I tried really hard to put some distance between mm -hmm. myself and the issue and not weigh in so much, mm -hmm. but just to be a thoughtful guide, mm -hmm. like you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to really have the, that perspective for people, right, who don't look like us and who, who are, want to be part of this journey and also have to find their place in it too. I want so, something to come from it. I want everyone to get something from it. Even if you are not a black person that's been having the kind of discussions that we had or rehashed because we know. <laughs> yeah. I think even if, Again, you are not a person that lives in a place where your government is moving towards a yes on this issue. You can listen and perhaps just get fodder for your argument that it shouldn't happen, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do also really want black people who listen to hear it and be affirmed and know that we, as people in the media, however we feel about the issue, are treating it with some validity just given what we understand about our culpability in treating ideas with respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in just a moment, we are going to see a, a deep dive into just a few examples of how that's playing out for, for Americans here. But before we step off the stage, uh, just from each of you, just to take away from, from your work on this podcast and, and what you're most excited about putting this out, uh, excited about for putting this out in the world. Do you want to go first? Sure. Actually, I it's working with you, actually. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say, when we started, first started working on this project, Soraya had never worked on a podcast before. And we had a lot of conversations. We had conversations about the anxiety of doing the work, about, you know, getting into it. And we just, I mean, I'm blown away with just how, I mean, it's really good, you guys. It's really good. <laughs> And I feel like I finish every interview and I'm like, that's the best interview. That's the best interview. So I think you guys are really in for a treat to hear just the thoughtfulness and the humor and the quick wittedness that Soraya really brought to the work and the way that she really tirelessly held her ground on what this work is. And it's really hard to do when you have a team of people who are around you that are supporting you and have their own ideas of what the work is. But Soraya really had the vision and I really appreciate getting to work with you on this. Mm. A 
hey, you got to come back with something Maybe really I should have went second. <laughs> now I don't know what to say. Um, thank you. It has been really good working with a partner. I know people treat it as if we're working like as one brain. Um, and sometimes we frequently are. But having somebody affirm you the way that he just did, sometimes you know we can get in our heads and we're questioning whether or not we're doing a good job. I said to Jerome, GBH is going to have to pay you because you need to live in my pocket <laughs> forever now because he comes with these unexpected moments where he's just like, not only are you doing a good job, but X, Y, Z, um, things that I will not say on stage. <laughs> um, I think the thing that most excites me, though, is really that we are at an organization that has a black news executive. It has been amazing in our meetings to sit with him and watch him champion this vision. It has been amazing to watch that he, in the very early parts of this process, was like, we're not questioning whether or not we're going to treat this idea with respect, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it a little bit easier for us to do the work that I mentioned before, just to affirm a portion of our audience that probably doesn't get to feel affirmed mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to affirm that you are both doing excellent, excellent work. I'm so proud of both of you again. Soraya Wintersmith and Jerome Campbell behind the podcast, What is Owed, coming this month from GBH News. Thank you. show a clip from the podcast. Um, yes. yes. So before we go to the movie, we we're, sh we're going to show a clip from the podcast. movement as well. So when we say that this document helps us understand reparations, I think it really does uh, do the work that so many people are grappling. This is how a formerly enslaved woman became the first person in Massachusetts to fight for reparations and win. Almost. Belinda Sutton lived here at the Royal House, what is now the city of Medford just outside Boston. 200 years ago, this was a sprawling plantation. She was among the dozens of enslaved people who labored here. 50 years, her faithful hands have been compelled to ignoble servitude for the benefit of an Isaac Royal, until a terror of men armed in the cause of freedom compelled her master to fly. I mean, what an amazing passage, right? Historian Kiara Singleton showed me the original petition Belinda Sutton filed. It's quite amazing. I mean, we do not have many documents like this from black women in the 18th century. Belinda Sutton filed the petition after becoming emancipated from her enslaver's estate in 1783. She starts with talking about where she grew up, which um, we have come to uh, understand that that's modern Ghana. Belinda Sutton is making it very clear that not only does she have a homeland, but she had a family, and slavery was the reason why she was taken away from both her home and her family. So what we can think about is that she is a part of this active, rich, black abolitionist and radical black community who are at the front lines of not only demanding for their freedom, but also demanding for the freedom of all black people in the state of Massachusetts. What can you tell me about the process Belinda went through to petition? What we do know is that Belinda Sutton is illiterate, and we know that because she signs her petition with an X. She would have dictated her story, and then she would have filed it with the Massachusetts legislature. And the court says, we agree with you. We do think you deserve um, to be compensated. But Singleton believes the legislature only approved Belinda Sutton's petition for reparations to punish the royal family for picking the wrong side in the Revolutionary War. 
I want to be very clear that that legislature is not saying, yes, we are actively and, and willingly wanting to give money to this 70 year old black woman just out of the kindness of their heart. What they're doing is saying, there's a new government in town and the royals were loyalists. She was enslaved by one of the wealthiest enslavers in all of New England. And so it really is a way for them to try to punish people like the royals. So the legislature gives her an annual settlement of 15 pounds um, and 12 uh, shillings, which is supposed to help her survive and take care of a daughter who, sh who is sick. She gets that payment only twice. While it is important that she wins that judgment, it's even more important that she doesn't get all of that money and that she keeps fighting back for that money because she needs it, but also because she's owed it. But what it does, it shows us the ways in which black people are putting pressure on you know, the government, on elected officials to actually live up to the promises of freedom. Particularly because when we think about New England and the height of the transatlantic slave trade, people are talking about the abolitionist movement. That means that there's a lot of white help and white advocacy. But Belinda, I think, is a testament to black people doing their own thing. Yeah, black people have always been their own abolitionists. And generally we have told, told the story of abolitionists through white judges and lawyers um, and activists. But black people have always been at the center of that movement as well. So when we say that this document helps us understand reparations, I think it really does uh, do the work that so many people are grappling with today. How does, in Belinda's case, slavery, but then today, a long history of structural racism and inequality um, prevent uh, black people from being able um, to determine their own lives and livelihood? Yeah, are so cute. I love it. The work is wonderful. Um, now, all of you who are here tonight, you have a job. This drops February 15th. You need to tell your friends. Subscribe to the RSS feed. There is a web page for it. Somewhere around here, there's QR code. Um, and be an influencer for this work. Uh, and I'm super proud with Lee and Soraya and Jerome, who I just met the other day, <laughs> and my friend Paris. All of you are doing great work. Cornelius, age eight. A discovery brings strangers together. Seeing those names, John. it humanized it for me. Every time I say I'm the fifth generation of Zeke Quarterman, an enslaved man, part of me dies. On a journey across the years. Feel article number 15, 40 acres, a mule, and $200. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. The enslaved got nothing. Congress passes the Homestead Act, Social Security, the GI Bill, the FHA. It's like pulling on a thread of a sweater. There's a long continuum of discrimination that has an impact on black people that makes it extraordinarily difficult. For my legs, I can't breathe. Connected by a common cause. Look at your own history. What was your family's role? Seeking justice and peace. The Cost of Inheritance, a special edition of America Reframed. Cost of Inheritance is about the long fight and struggle for reparations in this country. We tell that story through current day subjects who are working in various ways around reparations and grappling with what reparations is and means. Thank you so much 
so much for coming out on this Sunday afternoon to watch our film, The Cost of Inheritance, but a film that I don't think has ever been more relevant and important. I see. Nobody in our family said, and who is he? She opened that door for me, and I thank Sarah for that. How did we get so lost? Every time I say I'm the fifth generation of Zeke Quarterman, an enslaved man, part of me dies. I'm not going through that same trauma. I'm, I'm feeling healed. I feel like it's healing me. I'm just being brutally honest. I could just sit back and be like, well, Sarah, you know, I don't want to do this no more. I could do that. I'm ready at any day for him to say I'm walking away. This is too painful. But sometimes we just have to think outside ourselves. Yes, we're talking about white and get what they got to do. We already know that. How are we holding our own selves accountable? Reparations can't happen without relationships. That shouldn't just be transactional. People should have some sort of investment in understanding why it should be done white and black. I just want to encourage white families to do the work. Look at your own history. What was your family's role? Harm happens locally, so repair has to happen locally. Come on up. was an amazing screening. Having the participants watch the film, being in the, all together in a theater with an audience, hearing the audience reaction, the energy, um, and then being, them being able to answer questions that the audience has. It's one of the highlights of the process of making the film. Yeah, thank you for receiving this film. It's so heartfelt. Uh, it, it's so moving just to even know that our story has come this far. I think what will surprise people the most is that this is not just a story of dollars and cents, but that there is human reckoning from ordinary people that are like you and like me, and that it involves soul searching and not politics. Uh, I will admit I definitely had some hesitancy, I think, in doing something like this. Um, but anyone that knows me knows that I'm big on my people. People want to know this history. They want to know the information. White people want to know. You know, young people especially. I've been able to catalog the black history of my town, spend a lot more time with my elders. By being young and interested in genealogy, that throws people off guard. So a lot of people don't get into the context of history and your relatives until usually 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and I just turned 30 and I'm like, no, nah, let me tell you about these last 200 years. <laughs> they want to know. Why wouldn't you want to know the history of your country or your family? I think the personal partial reparations helps build the case for the federal government to make reparations happen at the national scale. And my grandfather tells any and everyone who will listen about the work I do, um, and now my community pretty much does the same. There's a hand here and a hand here. So let's go here first, and then we'll come here. When our team discovered the work that was going on around reparations, I actually said, I was like, this can be a hopeful film. This can actually give hope. And I love that. I love those kind of stories. We have greatly sinned in historic truth for which we implore mercy and justice. We are profoundly sorry. There's so much good work happening underneath the radar that we don't hear about. I think this film is a real platform to, you know, to show those other stories. It provides an entry point to consider what living with this history means, you know, and how to make it right. Just, just sharing a thought about the importance of the diversity up here, and I mean in the different approaches that's being taken to the same subject. What are we up against as we undertake this sacred mission? Fear, 
What are you going to take from me? They want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. Bull they are not owed that. I knew from the beginning that this was going to be a controversial topic. I always thought that it was best to talk about it in terms of equity and justice and not in terms of reparations, which I think for some people brings in mind the notion of cutting a check. And it's so much more than that. It's about leveling the playing field. It's about apology. It's about recognition of what has transpired in our past that brings us to our present. Yes, there's been reparations for other people, for other horrors. Why African Americans seem to be the only people who haven't received reparations, I mean, it's the big question, right? I know a film can't do everything. Maybe it can change a mind or two, but at least can open the conversation. This is the moment. This is the moment. Wow, that was incredible. And we are so lucky to have Sarah and Yoruba and Randy here with us tonight to further discuss this film. So we'll have a discussion. We'll have an opportunity for an audience Q&A. I'm going to tell you in advance. Think of a very brief way to ask your question, um, because we will have limited time. But Yoruba, I want to start um, with you and tell us a little bit about how you found Randy and Sarah, the other subjects of the film. Absolutely, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, GBH. Thank you guys for coming out tonight on this cold night, but the first night of, of Black History Month, um, which is every month, as we know. Um, so I was so fortunate to uh, have the producer of this film, Daryl Ford Williams, reach out to me um, with this project. Uh, the the film uh, con was conceived by a group of universities that came together uh, under the banner of Just Futures. And they came together to study, I think it was 15 universities, to study the issue of reparations. And within that, um, within that they wanted a documentary film and they uh, sought out Daryl and Daryl sought out me. Um, and so, uh, we put together a team, a production team, and a timeline. This was about a three-year process. Uh, and luckily, Just Futures had done so much groundwork of finding out uh, what was happening around the country with this issue, with reparations. And when we found out that um, there were all of these initiatives that were happening and that were unfolding, uh, we... You know, I said, we need to tell the reparation story through that, through what is happening on the ground right now. Um, and of course, Sarah and Randy and Lottie and Brianna were two of the people uh, that we found doing this work. And, you know, we knew immediately that uh, they were, you know, that we wanted to feature them, uh, b not only because of their, their stories, um, you know, it's still that, that first shoot that we went on that where I met Randy and Sarah and where we were in Savannah and, and Sister Pat Gunn and also realizing that the 40, 40 acres and a mule had been promised right in this region. I mean, I knew I had a, had a film right there. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's basically how it started. And, and there are other stories that uh, you know, there um, you know, are more than almost 500 uh, reparation efforts that um, have been documented uh, of personal reparations that are going on. So we had a lot to choose from, which we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And Randy, I'll start with you with this question, but I want to hear from Sarah as well. What was your experience being part of this film? It's, it's, over, it's overwhelming. Um, it's surreal, but I do understand uh, the importance that this story needs to be told. And like uh, Yoruba said, uh, yeah, our land is there to, as well, but the 40 acres in the Mew, when we're talking about the March to the Sea, the Battle of Monteith, that was the last battle before he went to uh, the Savannah. So the promised land, which you see in the film, 
that's where Mr. Eldrick Steele was given the 40 acres in the mule from General Sherman. And they're in the threat of losing their land to uh, warehouse development because of the Georgia ports. So seeing this film and understanding the importance of the bigger scale of what's going on, you know, of our history being lost, but it's being told at the same time here through this film is, is remarkable. And I, I think we're also seeing what Randy just said, how that history is alive today and the ramifications of it um, still, you know, with the fight for the heir's property, with the, the threat to promised land um, that you just mentioned, you know, that we're still fighting that, uh, fighting, you know, this, this legacy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my experience being part of this film was just um, being incredibly honored to be asked to be a part of it and that, um, you know, Yoruba would want to tell our story and being um, part of a film with an all black uh, female team of directors and producers was really incredible and from the first day that we met Yoruba, you know, I could tell that she just really was going to take good care with our story and so there was never any hesitation from us in terms of just being completely open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through the making of the film and your work together, how has your and Randy's relationship evolved? Mm. We haven't gotten that question before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let Randy answer it mostly, but um, I always like to say that I was so incredibly lucky to find specifically Randy when I went looking for Quarterman descendants. You know, Randy has such an incredible background and such a, a huge heart. And he was coming back from four tours in Iraq, um, you know, retiring and did not need to then be asked by a white lady <laughs> to, uh, you know, go through the trauma of looking back into family history. Um, and, you know, he just, he welcomed me into his family. And this is what just astounds me about white people that are afraid of doing this work. Um, it, it, in my experience, in Lottie's experience, and everyone I know that's done this, it does not result in what you fear it will. It results in absolute friendship. And, and I think that our relationship grew very quickly because we started to work together on the land and then we started to do other things with the foundation. But um, we just started talking and telling our stories to one another. And I think that's the only way to build a deep relationship. And so, again, I was just very lucky to find Randy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it just came natural. Um, as you can see in the film, I'm half Japanese, half black. So I was raised in Japan until I was 13. And uh, we understand the, the tensions between Japan and Korea of uh, Japan enslaving comfort women. And uh, I always grew up with these um, ideals of how Japanese saw themselves above Koreans. But uh, being serving in the army, my last five years was in Korea. So I didn't know nothing about this comfort, slavery, women, none of that, right? But I did understand how I viewed Koreans because of how I grew up. But my family called me in my office, which I had Korean nationals, about 13 of them working in the office with me. And I started talking Japanese, and they all went in the corner just discussing. And uh, after I was done, I didn't pay attention, but Mr. Kim said, uh, you Japanese? So I was like, yeah. He said, please don't speak Japanese in the, the office. So I was like, why? You know, um, <laughs> then he explained to me this situation, but now I'm reverting back to my black side of understanding, <laughs> like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm getting both ends here. So <laughs> the thing of me uh, saying to them, I apologize for Japan, even though it wasn't about me, um, and understanding the delicacy of what was happening, how they felt. So when Sarah contacted me, it all just came into play to how I was just living my life. So it, it was natural. And I just have to say that is so, I've never heard you say that story, but you know, it just goes to show that 
the history is specific, but it's also global, right? Mm -hmm. We have, we see it right in front of our eyes right now. Um, you know, a history of, of colonialism, of, of racism, um, and that's something that we should all remember too. Yeah. You know, as black people especially, we are certainly not the only ones mm -hmm. uh, that have been oppressed, and everybody should remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yoruba, there were so many directions that you could have gone with telling this story. What were some things that you had to leave out of this film? Geez, um, well, <laughs> there were many. Um, there were a couple of, of stories, like of actual stories. Um, one it was a story that we followed uh, a bit of uh, a man named Tad, who uh, Lottie had actually connected us with, who discovered enslavement in his family, went to, uh, we're in Missouri actually, and so we actually went to Missouri, filmed him, uh, you know, dedicating this black grave site, uh, this black graveyard, which had been, um, you know, no, had no signage and, 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 us, and connecting with other local white descendants who were also uh, uh, descendants of enslavers. And, um, and his aunt was there and it was a really great story. Um, we, we are excited to do uh, additional videos to put on the website. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was one of them. There was so much more to the Spellman story. There were other scenes with Lottie and Brianna where they actually find out they have a historical connection because of Lottie's many uh, enslavers in her, in her past that actually reached to Maryland mm -hmm. where Brianna's family was from. So there was, there was a bunch, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of things. And I thought it was really interesting, you know, to, to include those those dissenting viewpoints that we know are so rampant. And it, it made me think about the people who aren't seeing this film mm. and who, I mean, may not ever enter the conversation, but are going to be very vocal as this conversation evolves. Well, one of the things I hope, I mean, you know, we don't want to just preach to the choir, of course. And I've made other films that, um, you know, tackle kind of... Uh, uh, uncomfortable issues but one of the things I learned through making a previous film that did that um, is that people will uh, and hopefully it will happen here people will take the film and show it to their family members or their friends and it's a way of inviting them into the conversation you know that's what I try to do as a filmmaker how can we invite people into the conversation okay. who may not agree with us who may not understand who may but you know who who are open enough to uh, you know to watch it and I, and I hope that that's what's happening and that continues mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, and, and we're also, I'm sorry, just no, lastly, we are, we're also planning uh, to help do that, <laughs> a, a, a really strong impact campaign with this film so we can bring it to places um, around the country to, you know, to help stir those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is Sarah, that Yoruba's comment makes me think about your family, right? I mean, we, we see so much of you and the work that you're doing, and you, you talk about a cousin you have and, and these other connections, but how, what has the conversation been like in your family? I mean, is everyone rallying behind you around this? Yeah, I'm pretty lucky. Um, and as I say in the film, I'm, I was really fortunate to be told the truth um, from early on. That's not to say that we sat around and talked about it in depth, but it was never hidden, um, and it was talked about as um, a horrible thing and a horrible time in history and a horrible thing that my ancestors did, rather than, oh, we suffered so much after the Civil War, you know, we lost, we lost property and land. So that, it, it was a totally different conversation um, in my family, but um, my close family that's still alive, yes, is completely, my parents, my brother, um, my grandparents are not here anymore. I know that they would have supported this, and I feel like um, Randy says his ancestors you know, are on his back, and I definitely feel my grandparents, who did a lot of work in Savannah um, through integration. Um, but then, you know, I have some distant cousins that um, I've never even met that family is telling, you know, oh, watch this film. And I, and I got a really interesting um, comment that was probably the least positive um obviously a well-meaning older white woman but said um she said oh well um 
the the land that George Adam Keller had went to a different line, not my, you know, great 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 grandfather. So we were we weren't a part of it. Um, and you know, I I donate bicycles at the black church down the street. So I think I'm oh. good. Um, okay. Oh, and 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 I understand or. Or I do believe the the slaves were treated poorly, but at least there was an effort made to give ten acres or forty acres. Right. Um, and so it's not somebody saying you shouldn't be doing this. As reparations are a terrible idea, but it's actually somebody saying that, but thinking they're <laughs> thinking they're not. So yeah. I hear some things like that from the older, the oldest generation of people that I I really don't know, but I'm. Again, very lucky that everyone I know and love is is championing this. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for, for people who, who may take this story with them as they leave the theater tonight and, and, and have family members or people in their lives who aren't at that point to have that conversation? Um, I mean, I think that... Uh, you know, racial healing has kind of four pillars, and, and the first one is uncovering history. Um, and the second one is making connections, which Randy and my connection has been amazing. The third is you know, working toward racial healing, and the fourth is acting. And so I think a lot of white people jump to acting mm. and think like, I couldn't do it, what am I supposed to do? You know, whatever. Um, just start with uncovering history and accepting it, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know. Even, I don't want to call anyone out, but we were talking to a woman in the lobby before this happened, and, and just the idea, like, I think there might have been something in that old house that's now been turned into a museum that was, the story had something to do with slaves there. I'm gonna go figure that out. You know, what was that? And, you know, just asking questions of, of your family, um, about your family history, should yeah. be fine, and, mm -hmm. you know. You can start there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn it over to audience Q&A now. And as we, we do, I believe we have two mics circulating through the audience. Again, please keep your questions brief as we have folks making their way. Randy, I'm going to just ask you really quickly, too, because it can be hard. Like, I think about, in my own family, about 15 minutes from where my grandma's house is, there is an Austin plantation house. No one talks about the fact that our last name is Austin. Like, wh like what's the connection? And so, and you talk about how we have to hold ourselves accountable, right? Why are, where do we get tied up there? Um, like I said, you know, like I, I could have easily just, just shrugged this off and just said, okay, I'm retired. I'll get a job and just relax at my home, whatever. But holding ourselves accountable is, you know, uh, for me was really digging through the norm of not discussing the past and understanding and digging up Zeke, right? Now, yeah. you know, not digging up per se, but like digging his memory <laughs> up. We would <laughs> have a whole different conversation yes. about this day yeah. if that yeah. had happened. Yeah. Uh, but just understanding the beginning, like uh, Brianna say that, that black wall of 1860, but trying to get beyond that and try to see beyond that is enlightening. And when I say part of me dies, is what I'm what I mean is just to even think of the the horrors he had to probably go through. You know, um, coming from South uh, from Midway, Georgia, Liberty County, being sold as a boy. You know, like that hurts me deeply to even think of that. So, but at the same time, it gives me some hope of. You know, we just not a race. I, I'm not thinking like my father, like I'm a nomad. I'm a man without a country. Mm -hmm. No, I am a man with a country. I serve my country. My, my father served a country, but now it's time for the country to serve me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's turn it over to our, our first audience question here. And we'd love to hear your name um, if, you're, if you're comfortable sharing. Uh, hi, my name's Verne. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, my question is for Mr. Cordeman. Um, first of all, thank you for coming up here. We know it's cold. Um, we know you've traveled. We appreciate you and we appreciate your service and the service of your father as well. Um, we saw you in the film in your church home um, and just wanted to know what your, your faith experience, how it has intersected with this journey for you. A lot. Uh, 
thank you for the question. It's a great question. I haven't been asked that. But um, it has to be something bigger than myself. Um, like, reverting back to just being raised in Japan, you know, like, I didn't know nothing about religion till 13. You know, going to a holiness church, ke- seeing people catching the Holy Ghost was very like, uh, what is this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Why is this man up here yelling and spitting? You know, um, but I un- it, it came all circle now to really understand how my father, even though he, because of his pain of this country, tried to shun, shun me away from what I was really as an American citizen because I wasn't a dual citizen because my mother didn't put in my citizenship for Japan. So I was already born to be an American citizen. But just to understand now, full circle of what all that meant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for the question and the, and the answer. Um, do we have another maybe in the back there? Thank you. My name is Kathy. And um, I would like to make the observation that doesn't need an answer necessarily. Aren't we about to turn over a lot of wealth, white wealth? Aren't there a large number? Isn't this the right time to ask people who are children of enslavers like myself? Our parents are dying and leaving, sometimes leaving money. In fact, but I have to mention, in my family, there wasn't a lot of money turned over, but there should have been, because there sure was a lot of black labor. And not every white person ended up holding on to the money. But where they did, isn't it a lot of turnover now, demographically? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for, for sharing that, and I think that that is actually really true. You know, when we look at uh, we look at uh, wealth, you know, um, wealth differences in white families and black families, the um, the numbers are stark. Um, not to mention the money that is being made by the one percent, um, and uh, there's a lot of wealth in this country, and it's mostly in white hands, uh, and where does that, you know, we, we try to explore, you know, that basis, uh, why that's the case, and how the, the, the legal system, the system of slavery and Jim Crow, uh, from redlining, I mean, we couldn't even get into that in the film, education, public education, you know, why, how that was created. That's, that's not, you know, that's not, that wasn't merit. Yeah, I'll just say, um, it's not for me to say, you know, who as an individual should pay reparations. Um, however, that's exactly what we ask. Um, <laughs> that we just we won't take money from black people. People say, "Well, have you gone to Oprah and like tried to fund it?" And like that doesn't really make any sense to me. Like <laughs> it's like taking from the black community to give to the black community. So um, you know, we really we really don't love fundraising it doesn't feel good to ask people for money but we've been absolutely on the on the optimistic positive side we've been absolutely astounded by the people that have just gotten it and said yeah cost of inheritance i actually inherited a bunch of money and i have i'm giving some to this project to redistribute it um i think it's also important to say you know, some of, like, I didn't grow up, I didn't inherit any money. Lottie actually didn't either. She talks about all these, you know, folks, but she grew up pretty poor, and she um, she made her own money, and somehow that, too, that, that it's, it's kind of usually the families that aren't holding on to the ton of money that um, understand, oh, I don't, I got lucky, you know, <laughs> like, I... I earned it, but I didn't really earn it. I, I earned the privilege, I mean, I had the privilege of all the education and of being in Silicon Valley at the right time and of being a, an engineer and of, you know, all this stuff. And so um, I think just understanding what is the money that you actually earned and deserve and, and what do you feel is right 
um, to hold on to. And we also have to recognize talking about money is very awkward very. for everybody, <laughs> right? You know, in our relationships, in our friendships, and certainly as a country. Um, so, you know, there's that too. Yeah. So I think we have time for maybe one, one more question. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Leslie Credo. I'm the founder and executive director of Justice for Housing. Um, we created a program, sorry. <laughs> we created a program where we provide housing for individuals coming home from incarceration. Um, from there, uh, we try to, we're, we're trying to create home ownership opportunities. Um, this is the Jim Crow era, and what we have um, stumbled into the barriers we have stumbled is trying to get developers on board, right, to help us create that pathway. Uh, right now, we have them in public housing, um, but we want uh, to create generational wealth. So do you have any advice on how we could, um, how to break that barrier, how, how we get into um, that population? No, I, I would just say, I, I wish I had an answer, but I would have to understand the, the organization better and the context, and, and also I'm just not an expert at, yeah. at breaking through that very real barrier, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I mean, we know that, in, I mean, incarceration, re-entry into incarceration is one of the toughest things that we as a community, as especially our people, not just our people, but especially our people face, and then affordable housing, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I unfortunately don't know, but I know that the work you're doing is righteous and, and um, you know, that something has to give. There's an affordable housing crisis all around this country. In this city right here, I know where I'm from in New York, San Francisco. I mean, um, so, and we have a mass incarceration problem. And, but those folks are coming back and their re-entry, and hopefully, you know, as we uh, continue to make reform, uh, possibly abolition, <laughs> you know, we will, we have to solve those problems. Maybe perhaps, as to close, um, maybe you can leave us with, with one step that institutions can take and be mindful of when they're trying to bring people along to, to uh, repair some of these things. Well, I think, again, I go back to, and maybe just because I'm a filmmaker, I go back to the story, the understanding. You know, uh, why do we have a mass incarceration issue? What is that about? Um, you know, there are, there are fil films that I can recommend uh, that folks watch, that these developers watch, that these politicians watch to understand, you know, where that comes from. Again, it didn't just happen. Um, so I just, I'm sorry? Right, that abolished slavery except for uh, imprisonment. Absolutely. So um, we have to, and of course, you know, I, I feel like I always have to mention this. There are efforts in many states, in many legislators, to try to ban this history, ban talking about it. And that's one thing we need to do. We need to be fighting that. And it's not just Florida, you know, it's not just DeSantis. It's happening in many states across the country. And we need to, you know, I mean, we need to do something about that. Yeah. I just want to make one comment, or two comments. Okay. Could we get a microphone over there? Please make it brief, because we, yes. we've got to okay. wrap up in a second. Yes, my name is Kathleen Anderson. I'm the New England female co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. I'm also one of the members of the Massachusetts Black Reparations Collective. And I'm from Amherst, Massachusetts, the second municipality in the country to grant reparations. Mm -hmm. As part of the Massachusetts Black Collective, um, we are organizing our third annual um, statewide convening on reparations in March. 
And it would be great if we could have access to this film to show parts of that during our convening. I also want to thank you for having Sean Rochester and um, in this film, his uh, work on the black yes. tax is excellent. I, if people don't know about it, you yes. should uh, look it up and find his work. Um, so those are just some things that I wanted to mention. A uh, couple of the uh, Massachusetts uh, black collective reparation, black reparations collective members are in the audience today. Awesome. And um, so I would like to know, or I guess I do have a question. <laughs> about, I think we have time. I wanna, about look at our about production team, my eyes in the crowd to see. How if could, we have, no, I think. About the people who are here and who are interested in participating in this statewide convening to find out how to do that. Okay. Well, one thing I'll just say quickly is that you can access the film, it is on YouTube. Just, just cost of inheritance YouTube, and it's also on the PBS app, so you can you can show the film. It's this is public television. This is why we. Work and there's like a community discussion guide. And there's a community discussion guide that has a number of resources about how to get involved. Beautiful. So please spread the word. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Yoruba, Randy, Sarah, thank you all so very much. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to Chris. There he is. Right here, I'm right here. To, to close us out. So, thank you real all quick, so much. I want to say thank you to Paris Austin. <laughs> Paris, on, Paris is on the radio this morning. Came back tonight to do Not this. This morning. <laughs> and, I, and I think you're on the air tomorrow morning, right? Yes, listen, GBH 89.7, GBH 5 to 10 a.m. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Thank All right. You. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank you to Randy and Yoruba and Sarah for traveling to Boston to my community. And I want to say thank you to the GBH events team for helping us pull this together. Um, community conversations are very special. It gives us a chance to really get to see the people that we are serving, and I am really happy that we're able to do that today. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed the film. Please do find. And thank the you, film. Chris. Thank you <laughs> for thank you, Chris. your guidance and support and love for this film and for us. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Good night.